So thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be here today and to uh, be in service with you. I'm grateful again. Thank you, Reverend Elizabeth Forrest. Doesn't she look beautiful? Yeah. Give her a hand. Yeah. God's people are worthy of all the honor, all the honor that's due them. So thank you for your presence. I think as many times as I've been here, it's been because you haven't been able to. So what an honor to finally be with you in the midst of the service today. Thank you so much. I always honor our folks who serve on the Board of Trustees because I know the work is challenging. I've done that many times myself. So thank you so much for all that you do. Board members, raise your hand if you're here. Yeah, yeah, doing good work. Keep up the good work. Musicians, don't you just love it when WG plays? my soul and to this great community of Unity of Mr. Salem. Thank you for always showing up, for being present, and for giving what God has given to you to be of service to this place. So we're grateful. Glad to have my friend here with me today, the light that she is and all the beauty that she brings, and I'm grateful, very grateful for you. The crux of our talk today is called Focusing on the good stuff. Focusing on the good stuff. And before we begin, we like to have a time of meditation. The scripture basis for this talk is from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. It's where we frame our affirmation. And it goes like this. Jeremiah 29, 11, our affirmation is, close your eyes and take a deep breath with me. Bring your attention and your focus to this moment, right here, right now. This is our affirmation. I trust in God's plan for my life. He has promised me a future filled with hope, prosperity, and peace. I embrace each day with confidence, knowing that life is good and his purpose for me is unfolding perfectly. I trust in God's plan for my life. He has promised me a future filled with hope, prosperity, and peace. I embrace each day with confidence, knowing that life is good and his purpose for me is unfolding perfectly. Take a deep breath in, breath in with me, deep breath in, and release. Remind your soul and your spirit that you will be right here right now, that you have everything you need in this moment. There's nothing lacking. There's nothing we're doing without. Relax in the chair. Allow it to support you. If you need to, just kind of shake your shoulders, your neck, Wiggle your toes and say, I'm in a good place. Tell your soul, I'm in a good place. And I embrace this knowledge that good follows me all the days of my life. Good follows me all the days of my life. See yourself relaxing in this knowing, trusting in the divine wisdom of that statement, knowing that all is truly well, and take this affirmation into the silence. I trust in God's plan for my life. I trust 
in God's plan for my life. God's plan for me is one with a future and one with hope, full of goodness and mercy and grace and abundance and joy and peace and prosperity and generosity. That's the plan. That's the plan that love has for me. I acknowledge it, I accept it, and I live fully into this knowing from this moment forward, because it is so. Amen. Amen. At 59 years old, I overheat a little bit. <laughs> but Reverend Elizabeth has a good box of tissues right here. So you might see me wet, wipe a little sweat. Doesn't mean it's hot in here, just means it's hot in here. <laughs> uh, so good to be with you. So um, I had Ramona pass out a uh, sonnet by William Wordsworth. Does everyone have a copy of the book? Um, you ran out one? That's a good sonnet. Thank you so much. That is going to give me the next step. Thank you, thank you. Needing more is a good sign. We're focusing on the good stuff. I gave mine away. All right. This poem, Sonic, written by William Wordsworth, I encountered it for the first time, I believe, when I was in junior high school. And we had to, we were studying poetry and learned what a sonnet was. And for whatever reason, this sonnet stuck with me from those days until now. And every now and then, just the first line of it rings true in my soul. And has certainly been the case over the last couple of weeks. I'd like you to focus on it with me as I read it to you. The World is Too Much With Us, by William Wordsworth. The world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, sorted boom. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon. The winds that will be howling at all hours are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed out the morn. So my eyes, standing on the pleasant glee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his rhythm horn. William Wordsworth, 
Morris Worth wrote this poem at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution when he noticed that people were so caught up about getting and spending materialism and what machines could do and how we could move forward, how we could progress, as opposed to pausing just for a moment in nature to recognize the beauty of the flowers, the beauty of the moon, the beauty of the world around us. We were just spending and wasting and knowing these things that were around us as opposed to the God within. And he said, if I was a pagan, if I really didn't understand, see, I like this ability to move around. <laughs> if I really didn't understand the God of my soul, if I really didn't get what God was all about, then maybe I wouldn't be so forlorn. Maybe I would just, you know, rely on the Greek mythology and the stories that come from mythological sayings and truths, as opposed to the truth that I know within me. I wouldn't be so bothered if I didn't know so much about who God is and why, the role that nature plays in my life. But Wordsworth, an Anglican Christian, was well aware of the presence of God and well aware of the beauty of nature because of his knowledge of that he felt very forlorn the world the world the external activities of life are too much with us how can we focus on something other than wasting and spending how can we move from being forlorn to a place of joy and a place of happiness. So I, I've asked myself this question, I guess often in my life, and especially over the last couple of weeks. You've been with me the last few weeks, right? It's exhausting, this weight that we carry around about what's happening in the world, and we show up, we show up regularly every Sunday, every Wednesday, when we have opportunities to be a part of our spiritual practice, and we try to find ways to alleviate this weight and state of our world in a way that we can take some with us to carry us forward to the next week, only to be faced with Monday morning. Wow. And here we go again. It's exhausting, the, the shooting in Winder, Georgia. You've heard about it. The state of our nation and our world, the presidential campaign, and how we're going to focus forward in our future. For me, my aging 91-year-old mother and her care moving forward, a friend who was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, family dynamics and the physical, emotional, and mental challenges in my loved ones. Heaviness. But there is a way for us to continuously show up and recognize and focus on the good stuff. How can we sustain this awareness of the good stuff that surrounds us? How can we consistently focus on the good stuff despite the state of our world? I'm glad you asked. Here's the answer. Be ready. Oh, there's an answer. There's an answer. The key word is focus. Focus. How many of you know who I'm talking about when I say the name Michael Singer? Michael Singer? Michael Singer, okay. Michael, Michael Singer wrote the book, The Untethered Soul. And he, he writes it in such a way that the crux of his teaching and this particular book is to let us know we have a mind. We have a mind, but we are not our minds. 
We have a mind, but we are not our minds. In fact, we are the seat of consciousness that is the observer of the mind. Are you with me so far? I have a mind. I am not my mind. I am the seat of consciousness that is the observer of the mind. When you realize that you are consciousness, you're not the same as your mind, that is when you can be aware of the power that you have to focus your mind. The things that bring us challenge happen because we allow our minds to run rapid. Like a six-year-old without a parent in a department store. <laughs> I remember being a six-year-old in a department store when my mother wasn't looking. I was all under the, the clothes, I was all over, and I was a very active child. I bounced and jumped and skipped my way through the world. <laughs> until I learned to focus the energy. And it was something for my mother to look up and I wasn't beside her, I was some, I don't know, wherever, whatever caught my eye, that's where I went, that's what I did. And I jumped and I skipped and I hot, that somewhere some calamity would happen, some noise would bump, and guess who that was? <laughs> and some of us allow our minds to work the same way. We kind of just go through life and whatever our minds see, whatever our eyes capture, whatever, we just take it in and keep going, take it in and keep going. At the end of the day, we kind of regurgitate everything that we kind of allow our minds to see. When I thought about this this morning, I thought about the analogy of having a $10,000 camera with a big old lens. I watch sports sometimes and I see the folks on the sideline with the cameras and the, the lens are so long and I don't know what they do with those things. But imagine a seven-year-old kid with a camera like that. And we give this kid the assignment to take this camera and spend the day, show him how to click the button to take pictures, go take some pictures. The kid goes, yay, got a big camera. I don't know what to do with it. Click a button, I'll take a picture. Click a button. So the kid, Sees his mom and dad, boop, takes a picture. Sees a little, little sibling, boop, takes a picture. Sees his backyard, boop, takes a picture of the backyard. We get some stuff that's blurred. We don't know what that is. Looks like he was about to fall, but he took some stuff we don't know what that is. Big brown thing. We don't know what that is. The light is bad. We don't know. And he comes back happily and shows us his pictures. See, look what I did. Who's that? That's mom and dad. Oh, who's that? That's my baby brother. Oh, okay. That's my backyard. And that's, I don't know what that is, brown. Okay. Now, take the same camera and place it in the hands of a skilled photographer. And let the same skilled photographer walk around behind the pictures that the kid took and ask him to take the same pictures. What we'll find is the skilled photographer will take pictures of mom and dad. We will only see mom and dad, but we'll see the happiness and the intimacy that they share. The skilled photographer will not only see the little sibling, but will also see the light in the sibling's eyes. We'll only see the backyard, but we'll see the way the sunlight hits the blades of grass, the shrubbery in the backyard, the children's favorite toys. Oh, and the brown thing, that's the family dog. <laughs> the skilled photographer will pick up on the things that someone who holds the camera without a skilled hand will not notice because the skilled photographer knows how to focus to take the pictures. And the pictures, whether by the kid or the skilled photographer, are permanently left in the camera's memory. Be like the skilled photographer with your mind. Learn how to hone the skill 
that allows you to focus so beautifully that you capture things that are focused, that are clear, that bring out the light, that show the joy, that show the peace, the twinkle, the, twinkle, the star in the eyes, not just the random pictures that you take throughout the day. We want to be sure of what we're focusing on. We want to become skillful in honing our focus. What makes the difference? They both had the same $10,000 camera, the exact same tool. They saw the same things. Both sets of images are stored in the camera's memory. The difference is the photographer's ability to skillfully focus and capture the good stuff. Focusing on the good stuff. I work from home, and a large amount of my time is spent on uh, Zoom meetings. Zoom meetings. I love working from home, largely because I can kind of just roll out of bed in my pajamas, go downstairs, get some coffee, come back up to my office. I can take a meeting most of the time, 90% of the time, no one turns the camera on in a meeting. On Friday, this afternoon, I had just one more like 30 minutes max call that I was gonna hop on. And I said, I'll just take my laptop and stuff downstairs and sit on the couch. TV's going, it doesn't matter, I'm doing easy stuff, kind of repetitive. And it's time for my meeting. They go, oh, hit the button. I join the Zoom call like I always do. Now this time, in the meeting, everyone decides to turn their cameras on. <sighs> really, people? I didn't want to. I'm like, oh, downstairs, my office is kind of staged. You know, the background is in case, you know, when I'm in the office, I, kind of, I got the um, windows behind me, my bookshelf, you know, I got the right books in the right place, and, you know. But I wasn't in my office. Downstairs on the couch, there's a, a blanket kind of thrown across behind me. Layla, my 14-year-old Cocker Stan, is kind of bouncing around on the couch and playing, you know, and camera. Oh. Ramona's sitting beside me, she goes, you should turn your camera on too. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Thankfully, I got dressed that day because I had some errand to run or something. So my hair wasn't crazy and I had on a nice cat sweatshirt. And I said, okay, I'll turn my camera on. And Zoom has this option to turn the camera on with a blurred background. How many of you know about the Zoom option uh, with the blurred background? I said, ooh, that's the one. So I click that option, turn my camera on, and what that does is it focuses the lens of the camera only on the person in its view, and everything else is blurred. <laughs> they had no idea that the pillows were not straightened behind me. They had no idea that the, the blanket was thrown across some crooked, crazy way. They had no idea when Layla was wagging her tail right beside me. All they could see was me looking beautiful, by the way. We need to be like the Zoom option. We need to look at things specifically for the good and allow the rest of it to just be blurred background. Because our goal is to focus on the good stuff. There's an author, Mike Robbins, he wrote the book called Focus on the Good Stuff, The Power of Appreciation. And it outlines five principles of appreciation that can help us carry forward this notion of focusing on the good stuff. So I'm going to move through those briefly. The first principle is be grateful. Be grateful. First Thessalonians 5 and 18, Paul writes, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And there's some beautiful metaphysical interpretation that I could just go for hours on. 
But suffice it to say this, if we would learn to focus on the good stuff, this is what love wants for us in terms of when we hear Christ Jesus, our highest level of consciousness while we are walking this earthly plane as humans. That's the Jesus piece. Christ, the highest level of consciousness while we are walking this earthly plane. For us to give thanks in all, all things. One of the ways we can do that is to create a gratitude journal. Keep on the name, please. A gratitude journal. Take some time, just before you go to bed at night, write down three things that you're grateful for. Just three things. You know, it'll start out relatively easy. I'm grateful for, oh, this is so neat, a warm cup of coffee. I'm grateful that my car is in good condition. I'm grateful that I have money to pay my bills. It's easy to, I'm grateful for the sunshine that I saw this morning. And then as the days pass, you'll find more and more things to be grateful for. And as you find more and more things to be grateful for, you'll focus on more and more things that you're grateful for. What we give our attention to expands and grows. Where we give our focus, where we tell consciousness to look, that's what expands and grows. We can have good stuff, even in the midst of challenging times. And gratitude doesn't mean that the circumstances will necessarily change, but the way that we perceive the circumstance will certainly, certainly change. Number one, be grateful. Number two, choose positive thoughts. Choose positive thoughts. Proverbs 23 and 7 tells us, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, so is she. As a person thinks in their heart, so they are. That's, that's it. I mean, and, and that's part of Unity's, uh, one of Unity's five principles, is how we manage our thoughts. That's how we outpicture our lives. So, careful little mind what you think, right? Be careful little mind. There's a song in Unity, Our Thoughts Are Prayers. I love that song. Our Thoughts Are Prayers. We are always praying. Our thoughts are prayers. Be careful what you say. Seek a higher consciousness a state of peacefulness and know that God is always there because every thought becomes a prayer. I like the idea of having, along with the, the gratitude journal, having a mantra that you can kind of quickly, when you find that you're distracted or something's bothering you or something else has your attention, something to call your mind back to this place at this moment. Something as simple as, I'm healed and I'm whole. I'm healed and I'm whole. I am at peace. I am at peace. How about that? Seems stronger. Joy is my birthright. Something as simple as love. 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 It's a way of sitting in the seat of consciousness and calling your mind back into focus for this now moment, instead of taking these random snapshots all day long. A mantra. Maybe it's a favorite scripture, a happy memory, or a loving thought. By choosing positive thoughts, we create a positive reality. Principle number three, speak kindly to yourself and others. Speak kindly to yourself and others. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. The words we speak have tremendous power. They can build up or tear down. There's a story, 
I want to share with you about speaking kindly to yourself and others. It's about a little boy who is learning how to play baseball. So this little boy, um, he's pretending to be a, a baseball player. He starts tossing the ball in the air and trying to hit it with his bat. You've done it before, maybe? Toss in the air, hit it with the bat. So the kid gets the ball, gets the bat, goes out of the backyard, throws it up. And he says to himself, I'm the best hitter in the world. It's a good positive thought though. I'm the best hitter in the world. He throws it up, he swings, he misses. It's okay, shake it off. Tosses it up, swings, he misses again. I'm the best hitter in the world. Tosses it up, he swings, he misses again. He starts thinking, I'm not so good at this. I, I thought I was the best hitter in the world. He doesn't stop. He throws it up. He swings. He misses again. He says, ah, I'm the best pitcher in the world. Because I just struck out the best hitter in the world. Speaking <laughs> positively to yourself and to others. I'm the best pitcher in the world. Because I just struck out the best hitter in the world. So he found a way to frame his situation positively. Just as we're called to speak kindly to others, we must also speak kindly to ourselves. Have you ever noticed that sometimes we say things to ourselves that we would not dare say to anyone else? We learn to accept things that are not positive about ourselves. I would ask us to do like the little boy, reframe that in a positive, positive way. When we speak words of love, kindness, and positivity, we are sowing seeds of goodness that will grow into a harvest of blessings. Principle number four. Ooh, I have so much fun. I have five minutes of fun. I'm gonna move quickly. Principle number four, focus on the present moment. My grandmother used to say, don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. Those don't. Don't bark. You got enough right here in front of you. Stay in the present moment. Let's make an effort to be present, to take a deep breath and savor the moment. Number five, trust in the goodness of life. Trust in the goodness of life. Remember I said in our meditation, God's always, God's plan for us is for a future and for a hope. Let's tell you this story. There was a farmer. This farmer, he had a horse that ran away. The farmer had a horse that ran away. His neighbor said to him, oh, what bad luck. The farmer simply replied, we'll see. A few days later, the horse returned, bringing with it several wild horses. And the neighbors exclaimed, why, good luck. And the farmer said, we'll see. Not long after that, the farmer's son tried to ride one of the wild horses, fell off and broke his leg. The neighbors said, Oh, what bad luck. The farmer said, we'll see. A few weeks after that, the army came to the village to recruit young men, young people, to join the armed forces. The son wasn't able to join because what? He broke his leg. And the neighbors explained, oh, what good luck. And he said, we'll see. And that's what this principle is all about. Trust in the goodness of life. We can ride the highs and the lows and make determinations about life based on one particular point or another point. But what if we live in the moment of wonder and go, we'll see. It's not bad luck not good luck. 
It is what it is. And I'm going to trust in the goodness of life. And we'll see. Right away. Trust in what is happening in the moment. And that in that, everything is working together for your good. Focus on the good stuff. So we've learned there is a way to carry forward what we come here each Sunday to learn about, to give us a little refill, if you will. I have a car, it's a hybrid. And so I can fill it because I work from home, I don't move it very much. So I can fill up my tank mm, once in a half, maybe a month. But there are times when I see it getting real close to that E mark. Like I pull in and refill. That's sort of what a lot of us do on Sunday mornings. We pull in and refill. Take these five principles with you so that even if you can't stop by here or before you have to stop by here, oh, wouldn't it be amazing if when you stop by here, you are already full. Now there, that's the ticket. Take these principles. They are, number one, be grateful. <clears throat> Recognize and give thanks. We talked about the prayer journal, the three things you can write the positive mantra. Choose positive thoughts, principle number two. Three, speak kindly to yourself and others. Four, focus on the present moment. We'll see. And five, trust in the goodness of life. When we live by these principles, we open ourselves up to the abundance of the good stuff that life has to offer. Trust in God's plan for your life. Focus, focus, focus. Take the time to hone the skill of focusing on the good stuff. And we reflect on our affirmation, Jeremiah 29 and 11. I trust in God's plan for my life. He has promised me a future filled with hope, filled with prosperity, filled with peace. I embrace each day with confidence, knowing that life is good and his purpose for me is unfolding perfectly. May your week be filled with the awareness of the good stuff in life. May your eyes be open to the blessing that surrounds you and may your heart be full of appreciation for the abundant life that you are living. This is my prayer for you today all the days to come. And we say amen. 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 Thank you so much for your time and attention. I truly appreciate it. Hope something was said that helped you along the way. Focusing on the good stuff. This is a time in our service where we prepare our hearts for expressing our appreciation for all that God has given us to give back to this spiritual community so that the work can continue to unfold. And so I invite you to get your offering in your hand and ready. God's love through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give. I am grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, I should invite you to come forward.